So I'm really pleased to welcome Jo Soki as this afternoon's presenter. Jo has been teaching business, general and academic English for more than 10 years in Hungary, Poland and in the UK. Having finished her Delta, she became actively involved in teacher training and is a regular presenter at TEFL conferences, an assistant lecturer of methodology and education technology at a Hungarian university, and a content creator for several English teaching websites and video channels, as well as our own Cambridge University Press Wobble blog. So over to you, Jo. Thank you very much, Laura. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to see you all. I can see a lot of you are from Argentina and Turkey and, and uh, Peru, uh, as I can see all the good mornings and, and hellos in the chat. So I hope you can see my screen. I'm also going to open the chat so that I can see what you are sending to me. Um, okay, so let's get started. So um, as you might have seen, um, obviously, the, the advertisement to this webinar, I'm going to talk about activity ideas for different online teaching scenarios. You might have seen my blog posts on the Cambridge uh, ELT blog that I um, have been blogging about hybrid teaching, and I, I explained other kinds of online teaching. So actually now today we're going to look at these different online teaching scenarios and how we can motivate our teenage learners. Now, before we get started, I also wanna tell you that obviously there are thousands of ideas out there and, and activity, um, activity ideas. But right now, what I just want to tell you basically is how you can start thinking um, if you are teaching synchronously, um, asynchronously, in a blended flipped way, and in a hybrid way. Um, you might not know about these um, certain teaching scenarios, so I thought I'm going to explain them a little bit first before we dive in. Um, so probably you have all been doing online teaching already. And what we are doing right now um, in this context at the moment is synchronous because we are um, listening to each other and um, we are at the same place at, well, not at the same place, but actually we're meeting in an online platform and we are here at the same time. So it's synchronous. Um, now you can teach in other ways as well. You can, at the other end of the spectrum, we have asynchronous teaching, which means that you don't meet your students at all. So you never, you are never um, with them at the same time. They do their own thing in different times. In between, we have all the rest. So we can have blended or flipped, which means that um, you have a bit of online part before the lesson. And then you go into the lesson, uh, which is synchronous, and you discuss things. And then there is this very, very strange animal we call hybrid. I don't know how many of you have experienced hybrid teaching. That's actually when some students are sitting in the face-to-face -face classroom, while other students are joining in online. Now, Honestly speaking, I think that is the hardest to manage um, because you have to pay attention to two complete different sets of students. Um, but I'm going to show you different activity ideas for how to make that um, scenario more enjoyable. So let's get started. I'm going to start with a synchronous activity. And for that, I'm going to use this funny image that I found. Actually, I remember that this was a an award winner at some photo, a photography competition. Um, so you can use something funny and uh, enjoyable, um, such as this photo. And we're going to um, answer some questions that I'm going to be asking you. So if you remember, I told you that it's totally fine if you say hello and good morning and good afternoon, whatever the time it is at your place. But right now we're going to use the chat for something else. So I'm going to make this question mark disappear from here. And we're going to use this uh, yellow box for something else. I'm going to reveal questions one by one. And I would love to get some responses from you in the chat. 
So first question is, what are these two animals in the picture? Can you send something in the chat? Ooh, very good. Uh-huh. Perfect, a wolf and a beaver. This seems to be the most common answer. Groundhog, uh-huh. To be honest, I was thinking this is a groundhog actually and some sort of an Arctic wolf or um, an Arctic like kind of wolf and a fox because if you can see it, it has a very strange face. So we're gonna say that we can see a, a wolf and a groundhog. Very good, thank you for your answers. Now um, be prepared for the next one. And that's going to be, what do you think? Oh, marmot, sorry, I actually forgot what it was. It's a marmot actually. So what do you think the marmot is saying? So you can see this speech bubble over here. What do you think it is actually saying? Oh, very good, get out of the way. Social distancing, I love it. Don't eat me, go vegan, awesome. Okay, I, I think I'm gonna go with that. I love that. Go vegan, perfect. Okay, wonderful. All right, moving on. Let's see the next one. What do you think? Oh, I also need to move all the windows. What do you think it's thinking? So maybe it says go vegan, but what do you think it's thinking? Oh my God, I'm so dead. Very good. Very good. Why are you so obsessed with me? Okay. You are not my mom. Very good. Um, perfect. Okay, so I'm just gonna put it in brackets. <laughs> Is this the end? Okay. Very good. So we've got what it says and also what it thinks. Moving on. How did the marmot end up there? So how did they end up in this situation? Walking, foraging for food, okay. Uh-huh, okay, I'll, I love that. I'm gonna go with that. So the marmot was foraging for food. Good, moving on. It got wings and it flew from there. Okay, very nice. What happened to the marmot after uh, the picture was taken? What do you think happened after this particular moment? It escaped, okay, okay. Oh, good. I'm very happy to see that most of you are optimistic. Some of you are, are realistic and you're saying that it was eaten. Let's, let's say that it ran away. Very good. And then the final question is, how would this marmot describe this day? So let's imagine that our marmot is writing a diary and how would it describe the day? Hectic, stressful, astonishing, uh -huh. okay. Lucky and stressful, okay. These are some of the words that you're sending me. So lucky and stressful. Okay, very good. So what I was doing, and I'm just gonna put your answers over here. So what I've been doing right now, you gave me all sorts of input. So this is what you can do with your students as well um, in a synchronous lesson. Um, oh, somebody asked me which tool I'm using. Actually, I'm going to uh, refer to that. This is Google Jamboard, but the, um, I found a very cool um, trick that I'm not showing you the entire screen, but I'm only showing you a part of my screen and Zoom lets me do that. So that's a very good thing. You, are, you cannot see that I'm using Google Jamboard. So you've been answering my questions and this is what you can do with your students as well in a synchronous class. This is a very good idea if you want everyone to be involved um, because there might be shyer students, especially with teenagers. You can have shy students or students who don't really think they should be contributing. Some students who are much more active than the others. So 
it's a good way to just ask questions. And actually, you might want to use the chat for that. So it's a good idea to, obviously, you can tell them to just say it out loud in an open class. But something to bear in mind when you're doing an open class um, activity like this is that still, as I said, there might be shy students. So it's a good idea to use the chat box like you did right now. I got lots and lots of ideas and I can pick and choose which ideas I want to go with. So what happens now? Because I elicited a lot of great ideas from you. We basically used elicitation and scaffolding. These are two key words that have happened right now. Scaffolding is when I try to build everything up um, and I try to help my students go on to the next task. They, they now know how these animals are called. Um, they are familiar with the situation. Um, this is a time when I can pre-teach some vocabulary. Maybe a stronger student um, gives an idea that the others don't know yet. So we can pre-teach these things and um, scaffold the whole activity. What happens next? I told you that this is a synchronous activity. So this is where I'm going, or this is when I'm going to put them into breakout rooms. If you're teaching through Zoom, it's a very simple thing to do. But as I know, Microsoft Teams, Google, uh, Google Meet, they all let. Um, so now they have this as a function to have breakout rooms. You put your students into breakout rooms and give them a writing task. My writing task background story is that, and this is uh, why I asked you the sixth question, how would this marmot describe this day? This marmot is actually an Instagram influencer, just to go with the trend and the 21st century. So he's an influencer and he needs to create an Instagram post uh, about this terrible day, so something like a, a press release. And the task is to come up with the press release. So um, what you would do in this case is that you send your students off into breakout rooms. You give them one Google document where they can work each, and I'm gonna show that right now, each group would get one page where they can write their story. Using Google, or if you're using Microsoft, then something that, that corresponds to Google Docs in the Microsoft universe is a good idea because you can um, monitor what they are doing without even having to go into the breakout room. So you can see whether they are working, whether they are having anything like troubles or problems and then you can go into the room and help them. So giving them a page um, or giving each group a page lets you monitor the process. And I created a sample text. So this is full of mistakes, if you can see, um, but we're very happy they produce something. And what you can do next when um, they come back is that First of all, it's, you know, it's a good idea to let them reflect on um, the content of their work. So what you can ask them to do once they are back in the main room is to just read through um, the, the different letters and vote on the best one or the most original one. That's one thing. They always like to be rewarded and then they can say that, wow, my press release is the best. But then the second one is when you can introduce peer feedback. Obviously, the teacher can give feedback. That's totally fine. But you want to involve your students a little bit more. And you can send them back into breakout rooms, give them a different group's letter, and rely on their feedback. Um, it can help a lot in terms of learner autonomy, um, they can feel that they are part of the process. And also you can see whether they think something in a different way uh, to what you think. So maybe they will correct something that shouldn't be corrected. That's also then something you can reflect on. And what you can see here um, is also something I would recommend is put the task description onto the document 
or in the document because they will obviously forget, um, they won't listen or, uh, or something gets lost along the way. So it's a good idea to make it very clear what you want them to do. I even highlighted the part in yellow, which, they, which shows that they need to highlight something in yellow and the same in purple. Uh, what I also did here is that um, I would like them to highlight something positive and something, I don't say negative, but something that needs some work. Um, and then when you come back into the class, you can discuss all these uh, different things that they highlighted. For example, let's do a very quick one. What would you highlight in yellow? Let's focus on something that's good. Can you see something in this sample text that looks really good that I should highlight? You can put that in the chat if you see anything. Oh, somebody said the opening at the top of my lungs. Very good. Use of past tense. Uh huh. Actually, yes. I um, at the top of my lungs. I put that there on purpose because I wanted you to like comment on how what an amazing expression that is. Um, yeah, past tenses. Actually, very good. The topic that wanted to be in, introduced in this sample writing is the past like how this student is trying to use the past tense and whether um, or how you would focus on that later on. Okay, so coming back to this, what happened is that we had collection of ideas, elicitation, scaffolding, group writing, and then peer feedback. These were the things we did um, in this case. As you can see, this is where they could write their um, letters. But something's hiding behind this blue box over here. I'm going to make it disappear. You can have an alternative. So all these activities that I would like um, to show you today, they are, they are using a mix of different skills. So speaking, listening, reading, and writing, we all had this in this previous activity. An alternative is to turn it upside down. And instead of making them write the story first, you read the story first to them. That's the basis of dictogloss, if you, um, if you haven't heard of it yet. So you read the story first, they try to listen, um, and then they are asked to recreate the story um, and try to make it as similar to the original that you read them as possible. They would do that in groups and it's a similar writing task, but starts in a slightly different way. So these were some ideas for a, a fun synchronous lesson, but let's see now the most difficult one, the hybrid. Now, you might think that, oh my God, what is this very chaotic looking image here? Um, basically in a hybrid environment, um, what we need to focus on is how we can include both the face-to-face -face ones and the online ones. The best idea is to have, first of all, a platform where they can collaborate and a task they can um, collaborate on. I took this particular task that you can see right now from the Fluency First blog, which I totally recommend. They, they um, promote task-based learning activities. I think this is a great idea to design your own theme park. And what happens here is that both the online students and the face-to-face -face students look at the same task and they can communicate um, through various means. They can text, um, like you put them together. The best idea would actually be to put the online and face-to-face -face ones together in one group, even though they are not physically in the same uh, location, but they can text each other, they can WhatsApp each other, they can FaceTime each other, so there are so many means to communicate with each other. You just put them in different corners of the physical classroom and they can do their work um, there. 
don't worry if you have one face-to-face -face students with two online ones together. They can, I, I'm pretty sure they can um, handle this, um, this situation. And the good thing is that they can, they have a task to an, an a goal and they need to work together to do it. So for example, what's my name? They should give a name to the theme park, decide on the entry fee, the main theme, the main attraction. And if, um, and that's a very good idea, if they finish early, as you can see over here, here's a four early finisher sticky note that you just delete. Then they need to design the marketing plan of the park. So they get more if they finish early. The idea here is that they've got a goal and that's the best way to, to overcome the hybrid hurdle because most of the time we find ourselves stuck in this situation that how are we going to do discussions, open class discussions when half of the students are sitting somewhere else. But if they have a task to do, they, they, we don't need to imitate a real classroom. They can work in their little teams and then they can showcase what they've got. A similar, I'm still talking about hybrid, a similar idea is a scavenger hunt. Um, I'm not sure if you have ever done scavenger hunts, but they are also great in, for this particular hybrid situation. Why? Because you can um, mobilize and animate both groups very easily. And I first just want to ask before, this is also a box I'm going to make, uh, like I'm going to make it disappear. Can you tell me well, how you think um, a scavenger hunt can include both face-to-face -face and online students? So why do you think it could be a good idea? You can put that in the chat right now if you've got any ideas why a scavenger hunt could be a good idea for that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, very good. Online students can look for things in their homes, find Waldo activities. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, students in the classroom can have hands. Yeah, very good. Um, clues can, that can uh, combine both, exactly. So I'm just going to make it disappear. And somebody was asking, what is a scavenger hunt really? So basically it's not a guessing game. It's like looking for something. So a scavenger hunt is find something that's green, find something that's round, find a thing that has three sharp corners. And then they need to collect all these things and present it. So the good thing about it is that they can look for it anywhere. The, the most important thing to bear in mind is that you need them uh, to collect things that are available both in the classroom and online. So looking for blue things, red things, round things, big things, um, things that they can access um, in the classroom and online. Somebody said in the chat that the online students can Google things uh, easily and include those as well. That's a very good idea because the face-to-face -face students might have access to something which the online students don't have at home. So they Google it. They, with that, they show that they understand the word and paste the image. The same idea applies here that we need a cloud-based something where everyone can collaborate, everyone can add to it, everyone can edit it, and they can show and tell through the camera. So I can say, show me something that's blue, show me something that's a liquid, and even the online students can um, take part and the face-to-face -face students can also show into the main camera what they have found. So it's a very rewarding task and it can teach different kinds of uh, words. I put here some, I, some um, platforms that can be used for this. Obviously Jamboard, 
um, I love Jamboard as some teachers already started loving it very much because you can access it and put pictures into it. But there's a website which is um, particularly um, may, is made for this type of uh, task and that's Seesaw. You might know Seesaw, if you don't, it's basically a website for younger students and it's project-based. So it's all made up of different scavenger hunt games or find a plant in your garden, take a picture of it, upload it, and then say a few words about the plant. So again, um, this kind of task can include many skills. Understand the word, find it in your room, take a picture of it, and then speak about it. So they show and tell through the camera. So it includes, again, a couple of skills. Moving on. Now we're going to look at, um, I'm going to tell you in a minute, this one over here. Um, I decided not to, so I'll let you guess what this um, slide represents. I decided not to include completely asynchronous um, teaching scenarios again, because I was thinking that it's quite rare that teenagers or secondary school students are taught entirely asynchronously. Um, so I decided to include flipped and blended teaching instead, because that can have, or you might be already doing this. The flipped blended idea means that something is given to your students before the lesson online, and then you do something with that in the real lesson. It can be an online lesson or a face-to-face -face one. The best idea for this kind of setup is to record something and then share what you learned, talk about it. Now, we're going to use the chat box again, because I've got a question for you here. What do you think can be recorded for students and sent to them in advance? So can you just put some ideas? Oh, pronunciation of words. Very good. Explanations. Uh-huh. Very good. Questions, grammar explanations, video. Mm-hmm. Very good. Oh, many of you are saying pronunciation. Very good idea. I didn't actually include that. That's a good one. Speaking topics, vocab. Mm -hmm. Very good. Perfect. Recipes even, uh-huh. Very nice. I'm going to now show you what I had in mind these things and many of you mentioned a lot of ideas and I'm actually going to add pronunciation of words. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, pronunciation of difficult words. Exactly. So you can record the material and many of you said videos. So these are the so-called explainer videos and the next um, point, difficult part or a difficult like a difficult part of the material that needs more time to sink in can be recorded the good I like the main point or the main um, benefit of recording these things and sending them out in advance is that you give your students more time to deal with this certain area so um, they can watch it again if they are slower and they don't understand it so quickly, you can watch it again. Um, they can look into it and you can also give them checking questions with those videos. Um, so sending out the material, grammar explanation, as you said in the chat, um, can be a very good idea. Um, then you can ask them some checking questions and they come prepared to the lesson. You can also send them audio or video feedback. For example, they gave you homework uh, or homework assignments. Now, we, I'm, not, I'm not going to generalize. 
but uh, we tend not to focus too much on writing homework. So we sort of forget about it. Okay, they sent me writing homework, I'll correct it, send it back to them. But we can also send them audio feedback on their writing homework or video feedback. Instead of correcting every single mistake, we can just give them some feedback like, focus on this, check that, check that. They listen to it, that's an extra activity for them. And we don't work too much. And they still need to engage with that writing homework they um, send to us. So audio or video feedback can be something. Homework task description. Um, and they can present their own work. Somebody, I think, put that in the chat as well. So they can also um, send videos to each other. So instead of maybe spending a lot of time of class time listening to everybody's presentations, they can record themselves. Maybe they um, did a project or they created, somebody said cinema poster, that's a good idea. Maybe they created a cinema poster. So they record themselves introducing, this is my poster. I want to show you this and this and this and this. Students watch all the videos as if it was a gallery walk, but it's asynchronous gallery walk. They watch these videos and then in class, they share their ideas. So with this setup, we can outsource a lot of parts of the live lesson and focus on the discussion, the activation and practice in class. If you can see over here, I wrote some quotes over these little people. Somebody says, I know a lot. Somebody says, I don't know enough. So with the flipped approach, what you can do is make them watch the material at home. Some of them will understand a lot. Some of them will still find it hard to manage. What you can do in class, be it online or face-to-face, -face, you can group them together. And those who understood a lot could help those who didn't understand everything. Or you can give them certain questions that lets them um, deal with the topic a little bit uh, more and in, in more depth. So with the flip thing, you can outsource many things and save class time for practice and activation. I wanted to actually show you uh, what I created for um, one of my classes. But before I do that, I'm gonna ask you, do you do such a thing? So do you record stuff? And if you do, which websites do you use for recording things? Either you record something for your students, or you ask your students to record something for you. Oh, very good. Loom, Loom came in, okay. Flipgrid, uh-huh. Nearpod, I love Nearpod. Very good, Vocaroo. OBS Studio, yeah, I've never used it, though I heard of it. Mm-hmm, Flipgrid. Padlet, uh-huh. Although Padlet is not the best for recording stuff, but they can actually like, type and send in pictures. Mm-hmm, Screencastify. Very good, lots and lots of ideas. Oh yeah, somebody said PowerPoint then upload it to YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you the ones I use the most. You can, you can see that many of you put um, these ideas here or in the chat as well. I use Nearpod a lot, I love it because it's good for uploading the video and putting questions, checking questions in, uh, into it as well. Flipgrid, Vocaroo, the difference between the two is Flipgrid is with video while Vocaroo is without video, so it's only audio. Loom is great for recording your own screen. And Video Ask is something that I recently found and I'm just going to share what I uh, did for some of my um, students and classes. I'm actually going to share the sound as well, and I hope it's going to work. Aha, here we go, okay? So I'm just going to uh, 
play what I recorded to um, uh, or for a group of mine. I hope you can hear it. Hi, um, I'd like to try out this new um, platform, Video Ask. So the idea is that you look at page 61 in the book, um, you read task one, which gives you a task, um, which is about uh, designing a blended learning program for new employees at your company. There are lots of training approaches you can choose from. And what I'd like you to do is say it to me in a video like this, what you managed to choose, what you think your training program could look like, and why. Okay, so that's also important. Why did you pick what you picked? And you, you have two minutes to do that. Bye. Okay, um, so as you could see, um, the idea is that you just record the task description. Again, it's a combination of skills because they can, well, if you are, if you don't want to show your face, then Vocaroo is your thing because that only records audio. But if you're not um, afraid of showing your face to them, then you can actually personalize it. They, um, they might find it very nice if they, if they get a video of you um, in which you explain to them what the task is and then they can record the response. Flipgrid is very, very similar. And Nearpod is the thing I wanna show you. Um, I'm just gonna move the screen. Yeah, if, uh, you should probably see uh, Mr. Bear's day. So in Nearpod, what happens is that you can put in slides, but you can also put in videos and you can put in quizzes. So you can check whether they understood the material, you get a report, and it's a very well built up system in which you can put videos, slides, and quiz questions. And um, it's a very good thing for your students to do in advance. And then you can focus on discussing all the questions and problems. Okay, um, I'm just gonna put the screen back to, oopsie. Just give me a second. Yes, now, very good. You see everything? Um, and the, basically the final thing um, that I just want to talk to you about is um, just wrapping up. So um, these were the things we looked at today, uh, different online scenarios. So as I said, um, we didn't look at asynchronous, like 100% asynchronous, because um, according to my experience, but you can put in the chat if you, if you feel that it's different in your case, um, secondary students don't really get completely asynchronous courses, which means that the teacher and the students never meet and they only communicate online. That's quite rare. Um, so we looked at synchronous lessons, which means that the teacher and the students are there at the same time. We looked at collaborative writing with the help of eliciting and scaffolding. The, the other way around, it could be a dictogloss activity, which means I read the story, they listen, they take notes, and then they will recreate the activity or the story in breakout rooms. So it in, involves a lot of skills for hybrid, which means face-to-face -face students and online students at, at the same time. We looked at theme park design and scavenger hunts with the help of various platforms, such as Google Jamboard, Seesaw, that was that particular website which focuses on um, scavenger hunts and projects. And then for the flipped blended approach, which means that you send something out in advance and then discuss later, we looked at not an activity, uh, but more of an approach that you record things in advance and you said very, very nice ideas. You can record the task description, feedback, um, pronunciation, or diff difficult material. And then you spend all your class time on discussion. Now, what I would like you to do, if you still have time and you're still here, 
uh, in the chat, I would love to see um, what are the things you're taking away from this webinar? So what is one thing you would take away or you would even try next week or in your next lesson, whenever that may be? So feel free to put that in the chat, what you would like to try out, what you, what you are taking away. Oh, the wolf marmot activity. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to see that. Uh-huh. Recording, the recording. Um, I do think actually that saves a lot of time and it's, uh, it's added uh, work for your students actually. They don't read the book task description. They, they hear your voice. Mm, Google Jamboard, yes. I'm a huge Jamboard fan. Mm -hmm. Video Ask, yeah. The good thing about Video Ask is that it's very short. So Flipgrid is, I'm not saying anything bad about Flip, Flipgrid. Video Ask is even shorter. And if you know, our teenagers' attention span is just so short that two minutes is perfectly enough for them. Uh-huh. Very good. The scavenger hunt, that's also a great idea. I want to actually, uh, while you are writing lots of things, I want to show you Seesaw as well. This is it, by the way. And I picked a scavenger hunt game that I found from like, you can look for activities on Seesaw. You don't need to always create your own. And for example, I looked for an indoor scavenger hunt. You can see various things you would have to find in your home but you can create one for your hybrid students. And as you can see, there are different tasks like task bits, locate each item, use a tool. It's um, like it's seesaw specific and then send like the tool is for ticking the boxes and then send an image of all the things you could find in your home. And Seesaw has tons of activities like this. Um, it's loading now, so don't worry about that. Um, the idea is that you can use various project-based activities. Okay, I'm also gonna check what he put there. Nearpod and Dictogloss. Yeah, Dictogloss is amazing. It, it's, it doesn't require a lot of preparation, but it includes a lot of skills and um, you, you involve your students in the whole process. Oh, somebody did a scavenger hunt on St. Patrick's Day. Very good, very good. Uh-huh, very good. Okay, um, I think this is it. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I'm going to stop my screen share now. Um, and I'm waiting for your questions, okay? Thank you so much for that, Joe. I can see so much um, gratitude in the chat for all those ideas. I'm sure um, lots of people will be going out and, and testing them out with their students. Um, so if you've got any questions, we've got uh, plenty of time. So feel free to post them in the Q&A box. So that's the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, and then I'll just have a quick look now and see what's come in. So there's a quick ones. Um, that someone's asking for a reminder of the scavenger hunt name mm. and I, so i've just lost it myself completely the, oh the app, yeah the, the website yeah seesaw. The website. seesaw yeah lovely yeah. Mm -hmm. oh yeah it didn't i tried to type it in the chat box but it went to the panelists only so i'm um, sorry about that um some other people say, oh, um, how do you adjust the screen that you share on Zoom? So a bit of a technical one there. Yeah, um, to be honest, very good question. I found it out yesterday, to be honest, and it's an amazing thing to be, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Um, what you do is when you share your, like you push this big green button, um, instead of the basic options, you go into advanced and there you should see portion of screen. And it's going to be a scalable rectangle. You can scale it to whatever size you need. And then you only share what you want. I think it's an amazing tool. Fabulous. Um, which, of the, which of the platforms are free? Do you, do you know off the top of, of your them. head? Um, All of them, I think. 
Yes. So someone's asking about Google Jamboard potentially not being it's free. free. Mm, it should be. Have, I'm definitely yeah, using have, the free version. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have institutional access to any of these. And I, as I'm thinking about it, all of them are free. Yeah, they might have some limitations, but even Flipgrid is free. Nearpod, Nearpod though, Nearpod used to be paid some some elements of it the asynchronous bit used to be paid but now as i've seen it because i'm still not paying and i can access it so something must have changed and now it's accessible lovely um so i know you you, you weren't focusing particularly on um asynchronous but have you got mm -hmm. any any tips for people who are teaching fully asynchronous yeah, um, actually, I, I taught in a slight, like semi asynchronous way. For that, I use Google Classroom a lot, but I all, like I try to exploit all the functions of Google Classroom. So what you can do in that is you can also differentiate and select what activities you're sending to which students. I, I'm using that a lot in asynchronous classes because you might want to just give them a task based on the results you see um, which students need help and support in which areas so i select um, certain students and only send a uh, supporting activity to that, this group of students and another activity to that group of students also um, for example for showing off your work so maybe you created um, I'm using that at the moment, actually, you're creating a project or a poster. Um, I'm using the question, um, something so like question assignment in Google Classroom, which means that if you submit something, you can see all your peers submissions as well. So you can comment on each other's submissions. And I use that quite a lot because I want to promote peer feedback. Um, and that that lets them look at each other's submissions and give feedback onto each other's work. Lovely. Um, another question of, of restrictions in tech. Mm -hmm. um, what about when students who are in the in the face to face classroom actually maybe don't have the tech in the classroom with them that they can mm -hmm. use? And that's a very, very good question. Well, I suppose everybody has a phone. So the good thing is if they have a smartphone because all these apps are, are available uh, on smartphones, um, even Jamboard, everything. Now, if we are imagining a situation where students have uh, not smartphones, so the old traditional phone, that's a different story. That's a very, very good question because I know that I'm, I'm mostly thinking about cases when or when students have access to something a phone or a tablet or a class computer that would be one of my ideas a class computer and then the face-to-face -face ones would work together on one computer that is in the classroom if there's nothing accessible then i don't know how the hybrid setup works in that case there, there has to be one computer in the classroom so if they don't have their own phones they could work on the teacher's computer the problem is if we have 20 students in the classroom and three students online now those 20 obviously cannot work on one big computer but we could select representatives speakers um scribes always like one person to to use the computer for each task and then they can feel a part of the whole process lovely thank you so we've still got plenty of time for questions so feel free mm -hmm. to put some more in the QA box um some, uh isabel's asking about um assessment or evaluation of recordings and i think that probably applies to more than just mm -hmm. recordings so how do you assess work that's done in an online classroom very very good question and i love love talking about assessment actually because i think that in online education we really need to rethink our assessment practices 
Um, what I usually do, um, again, I use Google Classroom the most, is that I create uh, an assessment rubric for them in advance. So for example, if they are um, creating a poster, I will, because it makes my life easier as well if I know how I'm going to assess them. It's not going to be just a random number, but I will create criteria. Um, for example, um, color scheme, accuracy, creative ideas, and then they, get, they can get three points for each. If they see this rubric and I see it, it's going to be extremely transparent and they won't be surprised if they get a, a score. They like they will they will understand why they're getting a certain score. And I will also know why I'm giving that number. Um, actually, Flipgrid has something uh, similar to this in the website. So you can so, uh, like set certain criteria. Um, such as I usually set when I ask them to record themselves, pronunciation, accuracy, and task achievement, and maybe vocabulary. And then it's, it's obvious why they are getting that number. But I do think that um, formative and continuous assessment is a very good I, or approach or idea in online education. And I do that for or with my students that I let them correct themselves. So if they don't like the score or the grade they got, they have they can have a second chance. I don't mind if they work with it more. That's good, and work with it. And I don't I I, I wouldn't so I don't want to see like bad grades. It's totally fine if everybody gets a ten out of ten if they worked hard enough for it. Lovely, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I've seen it specifically, but a question mm -hmm. that always comes up um, mm -hmm. around uh, teaching, and I think it's probably really relevant at the moment, is motivation. How do you keep your students engaged and motivated Ooh. if they're not all in the same place? That's a, that's a very, very good idea or, or a good question, actually. Um, I usually use some sort of a warmer activity. So I try to... Uh, make them stand up and look for something. So it's like a short scavenger hug, basically, like um, find something that's, uh, that, um, I don't know, that reminds you of something or find something that you just like, just used before class or just show me something actually. And if they can show, I, I noticed that if they can show something uh, from their surround, like from their environment, which they can then talk about, they are a little bit more motivated. But it's, uh, it's unfortunately true that we have been doing this for more than a year now and we are getting tired. So we can do all sorts of things. I usually make them stand up, look around, or I can ask them to look out the window and tell me what they see outside. But at the same time, we need to accept that they might be getting tired and and we need to be accepting a little bit and might not, we might not uh, be able to expect 100% motivation and energy all the time. Yeah, I think even teachers are, are experiencing that fatigue as well. So uh, you've got to all be kind to each other, haven't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So a few people are asking how you, how you check work. I guess this is, mm -hmm sort of talking about um, different synchronous platforms that teachers can observe and monitor what students are doing if they're not in the classroom with them. Right, yeah. So as I said, uh, I'm a Google user. I don't really know much about Microsoft, but I know a lot of schools subscribed um, to Microsoft. Um, I think they use OneNote for everything as, I, as I've seen. I'm using um, Google Docs most of the time or Google Jamboard. The good thing about anything cloud-based is that it's, it's happening live. So you can, as a teacher, without having to go into the breakout rooms, you can see what they are doing real time. And they can even add to the same document after the class is over. So what I normally do is that when I give them such a task like collaborative writing or brainstorming, and I can actually see what's going on, 
either on Jamboard or on Google Docs, I don't go into their breakout rooms to check. I, I can see what's going on. So for example, it happened to me um, in one of my lessons that I could see that somebody kept opening a text box on Google Jamboard. I could see that happening and the text box kept disappearing. So then I noticed that something must be going on um, because something is not working. So then I went into the breakout room, asked them what's going on. They explained that they do need help and I help them. So it's, it's very good for just keeping out of, like letting them work and still monitoring. Mm. Fabulous. Well, I think that's just about all we've got time for today. So thank mm. you so much again, Joe. Um, lots of thank you. very happy participants.